<laughs> All right. Um, so um, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Adam Welch. I'm the executive director here at the Arts Council of Princeton. I'm in the, in the building, on site, on premises. Um, really, uh, really excited for tonight's uh, Princeton Petcha. Uh, first things first, thank you all very much for joining us. I know pe some people will still be coming in, and um, uh, but uh, I'll allow a few more minutes uh, to pass before we really go underway here. Uh, but before we begin, I want to make sure I thank uh, very much the Artist Resource Committee, uh, many of whom are on this call uh, tonight. Uh, this was uh, this this idea formed out of uh, those meetings with that committee uh, with Ryan Lilienthal, Joe Casso. Don Schrader, uh, McClatchy, Reinhold Ponder, Karen Stopler, Ricardo and Heather Barros and Maria Evans. Um, thank you all very much for the inspiration for this. Meeting. I'm really, really excited. Um, if you're not familiar, although I think there's not anybody um, around today that's not familiar with Zoom, but if you're not familiar, I will say uh, during this presentation, we decided to, to do um, the standard Zoom rather than the webinar so that we could all see each other's uh, faces. Um, but one of the things that we have to be careful of is that um, all of us that aren't participating uh, are on mute. Um, and so if you uh, can uh, look at the bottom of your screen down here, right, you see a little button uh, that says uh, mute. And if you can click on that, that would be fantastic. If you're one of the presenting artists, can I call you back after this webinar? If you're one of the presenting artists, yeah, um, no, 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 I'm just starting. It's from the art center. If you're on a, if if you're on an iPod, artist. it's on the top. Okay, yeah, if you're on an iPad or the phone, um, it's it's somewhere else. And then also too, uh, not a lot of people know, but if you if you um, want to shut off your video. Um, your reception, your, uh, it actually speeds up your broadband. It uses less broadband. So if you're having a connectivity issue, uh, that's something you can do besides moving. You can always uh, turn off your video until uh, later on uh, during the question and answer period. But um, just so you know, um, it is uh, the, the Princeton Petcha. It's gonna be a great activity. It's kind of like um, a speed art in a way. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to ask that nobody ask questions, but if you have a question and you're afraid you won't be able to hold on to what that question is till the very end, down at the bottom, if you're on a phone, I think you have to swipe, uh, there's a chat function. So if you want, you can always type into the chat uh, your question so that we can come back to them later on, um, especially if you have a question for the first artist, because the last artist won't go on for, um, you know, about 40 minutes. So just in case you're not familiar, I'll really quickly state that we're gonna uh, go through a series of artists. Each artist has, down the um, before. each artist is presenting 20 slides and they have 20 seconds each slide before uh, we move on to the next artist. So that's about six minutes and 40 seconds per artist. So um, we wanna make sure that everybody's muted and there won't be any disruption. And um, if you're an artist and your turn's on, you can always just uh, unmute yourself. Uh, what we're gonna do is uh, I'm gonna hand it over to Ryan uh, my uh, co-conspirator here, I'm going to hand it over to Ryan, let him um, introduce the artists. And remember, if you have any questions, type it into the chat and we'll revisit it at the very end when we'll have a little bit of Q&A and uh, further discussion. So again, thank you all very much for joining us tonight for the Arts Council of Princeton's Princeton Petcha. Ryan? Great. Thanks, Adam. Um, and um, thanks for all your inspiration with this um, project and welcome aboard to the Arts Council as the new executive director. Um, so Adam, I'm going to, uh, you know, in front of everybody, seek a little bit of direction. So I want to start just by sharing my screen. Am I able to do that? Yep. And make sure you click it with sound. And then I want to make sure I click it with sound and I'm going to share the screen and then I'm going to go to my, the PowerPoint and start from the beginning. And so what I want to do first um, is introduce the artist. And I want to um, um, uh, thank the artist for being part of this pilot program. Um, we're all kind of a little bit of um, guinea pigs in this, um, giving it a go, and hopefully this will work. But it's um, an honor um, and a pleasure um, to introduce tonight's Princeton Petcha artists. Um, I'm going to be doing a very quick bio on 
everyone all at once at the beginning, because once we start the program, we're going to go all the way through and it's going to be in this order. I'd first like to introduce Heather Barros. When Heather Barros moved into the Arts Council neighborhood 30 years ago, one of the first things that she did was get involved with this community. She taught classes, took classes, and it exhibited her work on the Arts Council's walls. Reinhold Ponder. Reinhold Ponder is a visual artist, activist, and founder of Art Against Racism, a nonprofit which employs the power of art to challenge and build anti-racist society. Maria Evans. Maria Evans is the artistic director for the Arts Council of Princeton, managing the gallery, the artist in residence program, the public art program, and all events and programming. She has worked with many artists over the years and loves to produce her own work whenever she has time. Tasha O'Neill. Tasha O'Neill's vision is to capture beauty that others might have missed. When people see her work, she hopes they share her sense of wonder and awe before nature's creations. Andre Velo. Andre Velo creates artworks that explore gender, women's rights, and consent issues using the medium of Lego bricks. Betty Curtis. From her Princeton studio, Betty paints far afield. Her series include sea and rural landscapes, still life paintings of fish and fruit, butchers, dairy farms, literary subjects, and current events, all in oil. With that, here is Princeton Petya. And Heather, you are up. <laughs> so this past year of COVID has been an interesting time for artists. Certainly it has been stressful, but it's also given me more time than I've ever had before to focus on my own work. Just like my prolific artist friend, Helene said about herself, I'm painting like a fiend. And the government said, shelter in place. This painting carries that title. I thought of the people who have always been isolated, who have always sheltered in place. Here, you can see the whole painting on top and an enlargement of the little dwelling in the lower right quadrant in the image beneath. One really good thing that happened during this time was that I was invited to join the Artist Gallery, a co-op gallery in Lambertville. I was so excited to get in that I made this painting in one day. It's called too late and reflects some of my emotions leading up to that moment. It's sold right away. In our isolation, so many of us talked about noticing and appreciating small things. A woman in New York City wrote a story about making friends with ants in her apartment. She figured out what their favorite food is and gave them plenty. I got to know some bumblebees. When my school closed, the number of students I taught in a week dropped from 120 to about 12. A young woman named Violet was one of the few. The two pictures on the left are hers. I admire her powerful line work. The one on the right is a portrait of her I painted while she worked. And these two are paintings, my paintings directly inspired by Violet's line work. I wanted the outer edges to be as colorful as the inner shapes. And actually that one on the left was, was taken out of my unlocked car one night. If you anybody sees it around, let me know. <laughs> Our backyard picnic table became my studio where my students and I worked. I've always loved the idea of honoring an everyday object with a painting. Here are portraits of forks, spoons, portrait of a can. I'm inspired by John Redmond's work. At my picnic table on different days, four children, four teens, and four adults and I worked on this still life all week. My picnic table is painted that color. I 
Actually, we painted in lots of backyards. This is Kit's backyard. Painting together outside is one way that we try to sustain our friendships. I met my students in local parks, cemeteries, and even the strangely evacuated garden landscapes of corporate centers emptied by COVID. ETS and the Carnegie Center were two of those strangely deserted places. I work mostly in oil and pastel. This one is a pastel. Pastels are very transportable. I took a road trip with a friend to Vermont. All of these stone walls, miles of them, were hand built by her father over decades. Princeton University was emptied almost overnight. At first, only gardeners were admitted into faculty gardens. Over weeks, people began to discover the campus, bringing their extended families into picnic on the green. The university generously tolerated all of us. The two pastels on the left were done on plein air in Hopewell. What you see is fairly representational. The one on the top right is different. It was started outside in Pennsylvania and finished from a photo I took in Kingston, New Jersey. It's more about the general idea of a canal and a canal path. Here's my process with pastels. I like to use a certain heavy paper I salvaged from recycling and I prepare its surface with the sandy brown red paint. I start my drawing with black charcoal to set up the composition, then lay in the rest of the colors. Another good thing happened during this time. I was hired as a color consultant for Estee Lauder. They needed an artist's input in selecting an upcoming color of the year. My job was to produce paintings to help them identify harmonious colors within a certain palette. Here's a painting I made up for them. I painted outside as long as I could into December. This is the lock tender's house in Kingston. He and his family lived treacherously close to the canal. Here, the low winter light is glowing off of the almost bare branches. I moved inside to paint. This is my first painting of 2021. I put these objects on a book with a shiny cover in order to create these shiny but dark reflections. As we reached the coldest part of the winter, I had been isolating for weeks. I thought about a psychosis people get when in long-term ICU. For me, the mark making here was meditative. The repeating lines and patterns in these works were my way of dealing with the kind of COVID madness. A quirky thing I've been doing is rescuing bad paintings from my reject pile. With nothing to lose, you really can play with them. You could take chances. I like this painting now that the pears and their leaves are almost black. <laughs> I used to ask my child students, what is your favorite thing to draw when you're all by yourself? I drew these rabbits late at night purely for the joy of it. And what would you draw? if nobody else would ever see it. Yeah, that was beautiful. Thanks so much. And um, Adam, just how is the view for everybody with the screen share? Looks good. Okay, great. Reinhold, I hope you're ready. Here we go. Hello, everyone. As usual, I am going to offer you something a little bit different that you might not expect. The art of apologizing during multiple pandemics, a masterclass, a Ted Y talk, or maybe just a thinly veiled revelation about my art practice 
accompanied by some colorful images. I don't consider myself an overly religious person, though much of my artwork reflects 18 years of attending church every Sunday. United Methodists were not quite this energetic, but we were showered with the life-affirming narratives of faith, hope, love, forgiveness, revenge, floods, and lots of blood. All those wonderful things that are worth dying for. I painted a Gotta Believe, which will be coming up soon, when I decided to become a full-time creative. It was for my mother. She was dying of cancer. I wanted to share with her the same energy she gave me from afar. I do not think uh, that she, I did not think she was God, but I thought she was omnipresent. Uh, ever since third grade, when I came home playing um, after being in the park after school, as I walked up the flat, I could hear my mother and a neighbor laughing in the kitchen. I came into the house, the laughter stopped. My mother asked me about what happened in the park. To this day, I don't know how she knew I had called my best friend a mother I should have shut my mouth. I apologized profusely. She didn't believe me. She said, I was just sorry I got caught. She got out her pleather belt and calmly told me she was going to beat me like a slave who had just killed his master. And that's the wrong image. <laughs> she was a teacher's aide, so she made me bend over a chair and she told me to spell out the word. Now, since the paintings are out of order, I am going to uh, just talk about the paintings. Hmm. What you what you're looking at now is um, I love to do pen and ink, and I actually started doing these uh, circle drawings on a lark because I was bored. Uh, or I was procrastinating, which is the name of this particular piece. Uh, and I did them on index cards. And um, eventually they looked good to me and I decided to put them together and I decided to do them on larger pieces of, uh, of paper and glue them to Luan. Um, now, I, I don't remember the name of these uh, offhand. But I'll just let you look since we were supposed to uh, have less talk. I like variety of my work. I like to experiment, which is one of the things that uh, I, I was doing, was planning on doing tonight was to experiment in putting narrative to the artwork because I, I am very strongly believe in uh, the literary connection to art. Uh, art simply creates another vehicle for uh, of language uh, for people to understand what the message you're trying to give. Uh, I'd use a lot of acrylics. I, I, I do all kinds of things. This particular uh, painting uh, is Fancy Dancer. Um, I love bright, beautiful colors. I'm madly in love with Serena Williams. Uh, <laughs> don't tell my wife, but she probably knows because I've painted Serena probably 15 times. Uh, but one of the reasons is because I, I love the human form, particularly dancers and athletes, uh, the muscular uh, nature of their bodies. I also paint a lot of uh, very political work. Uh, this one is uh, uh, called Abstract N-Word, which uh, came from, was part of an exhibit I had in uh, New Haven called The Rise and Fell of the N-Word. This is a picture of for Tulsa. This painting here is one of a series called um, 
keloids and scars, where I took leather, cut up leather coats, my wife sewed them together, I hung them up on a tree, beat them with a whip with red paint, and learned quite a bit about the process. Uh, and one of the reasons I did that uh, was because there are so few pictures of all of the slaves that were beaten during slavery. You, when you look it up, you only see one particular painting, I mean picture. So I do a, a, a series of those. I probably have 15 mm -hmm. of them. Uh, this is hands up. Don't shoot, shot damn, where I was looking for a universal symbol for hands up, don't shoot. It's kind of like a stop sign symbol. Um, so as you see, the raised hands with targets. Um, as I said, I love color and I love dance. Uh, so that's actually my niece, Bobby, who's a fantastic dancer. And this is called Revelations. <clears throat> it's really, it's a, simply a painting of uh, the end of uh, some segment of an Alvin Ailey uh, performance called Revelations. It disappeared. Oh, well, it was sold. This is Praise. And so I've actually done the same figure in a number of uh, medium. This time it's collage and acrylics. And I always go back to everything. It, it just art is just so much fun. It's all about, ex for me, experimentation. Rhino, thanks so much. I'm not sure what you had planned in terms of talking, but you were amazing weaving together on one foot. We'll just call it the lawyer in you, coming from the lawyer on this side of the screen, um, that was fabulous. Really appreciate it. Maria Evans. Hey, Are I'm not. Hold on. Here we go. Hi, everybody. You're on. Um, so yeah, like uh, most artists, everything begins with a sketch. And um, this year, this past year, um, we at the Arts Council, we wanted to do some murals that would give people um, some encouragement during this awful time. So this was uh, a sketch for our first mural, just trying to figure out what we were gonna do. And this is it up on the street. And this was kind of early on in the pandemic. We wanted to just have fun with color and letters and we got permission right away and that was the best part. And um, so this was the second mural and not only were we having a pandemic, but then we were faced with this very divisive election. So we wanted to do something that was really um, powerful and like uh, a nod to Liechtenstein. And so we wanted to not tell people how to vote, but just say vote. and. My good friend, Lisa Walsh, ex artist extraordinaire, brought her chalk line to the corner of Spring and Witherspoon Street and figured out all of these perspective lines. And my coworker, Melissa, God bless her every day, she's there uh, figuring it out with me. And there she is actually um, putting the finishing touches on vote. This was... Um, this was a very powerful mural and uh, very well recepted. Um, so uh, we were we were really happy to do that one. Um, these were really fun. They were just done very quickly. Um, and during this time, also the, uh, there was a Day of the Dead show in the gallery. And I wanted to make a bed out of flowers. So I ordered 950 straw flowers uh, from Canada. And um, they arrived and I had to figure out how to build a bed out of them. So uh, you can see the white ones were used as the fitted sheet. The um, pink ones form the pillow 
and the top sheet and the yellow ones um, form the top sheet. And I also got some flowers from Cherry Grove Farm who donated them. So um, this was supposed to be a detail of my bed, but I was so flattered because my Chihuahua came into the gallery and within two seconds, he was up on the bed and he is the king of comfort. And I thought, by God, that is a bed <laughs> because he recognized it and um, there he was. Uh, this is our third mural and this, Melissa and I painted this in December, believe it or not. We would be out there with our fingerless gloves and we wanted to do a mural that um, had the colors of uh, winter and also supported our local businesses. Um, and so that one is still up. So um, then I'm, I'm getting now into some um, ceramic work. And this is a little um, study that I did of um, a whole series of work that I wanted to do. And I, I plan to do these as bigger pieces, but when you want to work fast uh, in ceramics, it's a lot like drawing and doing sketches and, and working small. And this is that little guy with an underpainting of acrylic paint, um, trying to figure out how to get really good color on ceramics has always been a challenge for me. And I, I kind of love artists that treat ceramics more like a painting. Um, this is me dunking the guy into a bucket of enamel paint that gets really gloppy at room temperature um, and letting it drip off and then smearing away the paint and revealing some of the undercolors and then painting back on. I was walking with a friend of mine and she said after the election that at least we didn't have to run around with our hair on fire. So I wanted to kind of see what maybe that would look like um, through sculpture. Um, so uh, here's, here's one that is about to go into the kiln. I love working with clay when it's very dry and you can basically almost carve it like wood. And it's, it's really fun to work with then. Um, and this is a girl with um, a raccoon on her head and this is a rabid raccoon. And this is her coming out of the kiln and after the painting process. And I was listening to NPR and they were talking about how as humans, we have to be, uh, we, we have to react with a clear and present danger that when we encounter people, we don't really feel this danger. So I started thinking about that and thinking about how what if there was danger right on the top of your head and you recognize that this is a hornet's nest. And if I saw these things, if I saw a rabid raccoon or I saw a hornet's nest, I would instantly have this message is clear, back off, get away. Um, here, here, this is a, a, a bust with, um, I, I wanted to mix the paint. So this time I didn't let it dry. And you can see the um, blue mixing with the enamel and this crow is leaning over ready to, I, I don't know, maybe peck out the eyes, but um, here's a, a guy, if I walked up to a man in the street and I'm talking to them and they have this um, danger sign on their head of uh, the saw. So, these are these are little. I, I hope to make them big. I um, have been looking lately at the work of uh, Elise Siegel, who I love the way she treats the surfaces of of ceramic, and I always loved Viola Fry's work. Um, that's that surface work. Uh, this is a girl with a cobra caught coming out of her ponytail. Um, so um, that's kind of that's kind of where I am. Uh, now. Um, here's another guy whose head is catching on fire. Um, and I hope to learn more about how to treat ceramic and, and, and catching the, um, getting the glazes right and catching the colors that, that I really want to get. So I think that's the end of me. Bye, everybody.
Thanks, Maria. Well, you know, head on fire. I could really relate to that, having grown up with brighter red hair and a bed of flowers, flower bed that's fabulous. <laughs> Tasha. Yes, I am ready. All right, and here we go. In 1992, I had an epiphany on the DNR Canal. On the coldest day of the winter, I'd stuck a little point and shoot camera into my pocket, something I'd never done before. And when I got there uh, on the coldest day, uh, ice flowers had formed overnight, which uh, got me started. And in time became my passion, gave my life new direction. From then on, I was always looking for unusual views in and around water. Reflections became my trademark. At Christmas time a few years ago, I spotted this ice formation by the roadside in the Pine Barrens. While kayaking in Maine, I'm aware of reed squiggles made by my paddle on the water. And at another time, I found myself within abstract reflections of trees. You have no idea how hard it is to try to take pictures while your boat is still moving. I was attracted to these water lily pads and especially the red underside of the leaves in the pine barrens. Wandering about around the Princeton campus, I spotted this reflection in a puddle with the red leaf perfectly placed. Careful cropping was essential to bring out the beauty. I'm forever looking for new ways of capturing what other people miss. My eye has been honed to exploit serendipity, the good luck that comes to those who do not seek. When I wrote the Vaporetto on the Grand Canal in Venice, the boat approached the Academia stop. A quick shot yielded this image with the Basilica di Santa Maria della Salute in the background. And now a complete change in venue. This is Bass Harbor on Mount Desert Island, Maine, where I'm looking into the old window of Thurston's Lobster Pound with the harbor and its fleet of lobster boats reflected. I love the simplicity of the single dewdrop in which my garden is up, turned upside down. I try to isolate my subject before a neutral background. This one was shot with a hundred millimeter macro lens. And then there are days in the winter when one has to resort to one's creativity and just play. I placed parsley blossoms in a wine glass and poured sparkling water over it. The bubbles adhere and little created little worlds. This image I call the kiss, a rhododendron blossom in fizzy water and voila, a new creation. Try it, it's fun. Just make sure that the water isn't too cold and the glass, or else the glass will fog up. And then one day in January 2016, I was out early driving over the Harrison Street Bridge and spotted that rare phenomenon of hoar frost, which is frozen fog covering everything along the path. In all my years in Princeton, I've never seen what is so common in my native Germany. Every branch, twig, weed, and seed pod was covered in ice crystals.
Here I'm looking down from the old bridge in Kingston, where branches hanging over the Millstone River had acquired frozen ballerina skirts. Driving through the Pine Barrens and its cranberry bogs at Christmas time, the bogs were frozen and so were the few berries that had escaped the harvest. And here they are covered in ice crystals. Many people drove by not seeing the beauty. I took advantage of it. Some years ago, we had a spectacular fall. An outing to Ken Lockwood Gorge above Clinton, New Jersey yielded a treasure trove of images with the colorful leaves reflected in a branch of the Raritan River. The next day, I visited Barbara Smoyer Park on Snowden Lane. The small pond had a fountain going which distorted the reflection of the trees. And here's another one from the same location. I call it Ondine, the water nymph. When I saw the image in the computer, I noticed the shape of a woman's torso on the left. Can you see it too? And this was a big surprise and totally out of the norm. This peregrine falcon was posing on the speed sign that said 15 miles per hour. He was just sitting there being admired from everybody. Gosh, thank you. What a, what a treat being able to see uh, nature, like a, the, the, the wonder and awe, as you put it, through your lens. Thanks yeah. so much. You're welcome. Andre, you ready? Yep, I'm ready. Okay. Here we go. All right, let's dive straight in. So this is the beginning of my Lego art career, if you like, 2014, uh, channeling my biggest inspiration when I was younger, Andy Warhol. You can see I'm channeling the uh, whole Andy Warhol look with the colors. And I made two other colorways, which I never actually built, but I designed. But I moved on to other things. Uh, another one from this, the early years, 2015, State of the Union. Uh, I did this, I developed this noise style because I was trying to get the most out of the pixels themselves. Uh, I thought the noise kind of represented the blurring of the message of politicians back then. Things have changed a little bit. Okay, uh, so those two are both uh, the flat style. I'd already moved into three dimensions at this point. Uh, here's uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, probably my most well-known portrait. If there is such a thing, uh, it needs no comment from me. Uh, there it is. What a great person, sadly missed. Okay, beach day. This is from a series called Freedom Without Judgment. Uh, I like to think this piece played its uh, own small part in not only being inspired by, but in also getting the dress code of Princeton Public Schools actually changed a few years back. This is my personal favorite from the Freedom Without Judgment uh, series, which is all about commenting on uh, girls and women being able to wear what they want without any judgment or comment from anybody else. Uh, I actually, this was in the Affordable Art Fair in New York and it sold in 45 minutes, which I was a bit disappointed by actually. Uh, okay, this is a really fun piece, sold to a collector in Texas. Uh, this comments on the different form, function and ultimately the judgment of men and women through the underwear they wear. And let me just tell you, this piece is extremely tactile.
Okay, Lebutin. I mean, everybody loves a pair of Lebutins. I sold a, a version of this at the Affordable Art Fair as well. And then I was very lucky to get a commission to build a second one, which was this one. Uh, you can screw this uh, photo shows the three dimensions quite well, I think. Okay, flawless. Flawless because this is based on the outfit that Beyonce wore at Coachella in 2018. And if you're going to do Freedom Without Judgment, I think Beyonce is a great person to start with or, or work with because, you know, she owns everything she wears. Uh, this one is a great opportunity uh, to check out the video of this on my Vimeo account. Uh, this piece was actually built by staff and students at Princeton University, as you can see from the photos on the right. Uh, it was built in five extremely hardworking hours and all the participants had to practice consent between each other as they built the piece. Uh, also around that time, I wanted to experiment in nudes and I was wondering whether with the blurring technique you could actually make people wonder whether they see male and female in the figure and what aspects of the figure made them uh, see those things. And this is one of those experiments. I have another series called Mask of Femininity and these are composite uh, portraits which blend together features from different uh, photos of women from different uh, pictures. And uh, this one was actually done actually with trans women only. Uh, my personal favorite of the strawberries that I've done, uh, purple is the color that represents victims and survivors of domestic violence, which everybody, well, most people know me knows that's a big thing close to my heart. And this piece actually hangs in the sexual harassment assault, assault advice resources and education office of Princeton University. Oh, so the pandemic hit, I was very fortunate to get commissioned to make these four portraits just a couple of weeks after we were in lockdown. And I don't think without making these, I would have got through those first few weeks. I'm putting this one up. This is actually my favorite commission piece I've ever done. Uh, and don't ever ask me to do your dog, by the way. Uh, I love this piece so much. Uh, I want to do one for myself one day, but you can see how I really got the three dimensions into the earrings on this. And that's uh, with the slope Lego bricks and stuff like that. I was just worked out perfectly. Uh, I clap for, okay. So you have to imagine these two pieces are a GIF that are animated. I was very fortunate to be asked to contribute this to a British artist, Ian Berry, and these were projected onto buildings in the United Kingdom, as you can see from the photos on the right. It was to uh, thank the frontline workers for all the efforts they've been doing during the early stages of the pandemic. And we got it onto Princeton Library as well. Uh, another reason to check out my Vimeo page is I did a time-lapse video for this and a short film to go along with it that was part of the Princeton Environmental Film Festival just now. And if you go on the Vimeo page, you can see this video and it shows exactly how I build each piece. Uh, just a bit of fun here. I decided to go with these mini pieces as kind of unlimited editions. Very fun to make, uh, very hard to design. They only have 39 by 39 pixels in each one. But yeah, only, that's why I've only done four so far because it's very difficult to pull it off. I thought I'd show you one more strawberry. I've done the strawberry in many colors. Uh, the kind of different colors and colorways to me represents, you know, diversity, love and equality. And that's kind of as a collection, how I, how I see them. Uh, my dream, I don't know how many more there's gonna be. My dream is that somebody's gonna ask me one day to build a really, really big one. Okay, right up onto the present day, dress code. This was a variation on my freedom without judgment theme that I discussed earlier showed this at the gallery in New York in January and we sold it through the gallery and that's kind of getting you right up to date on the whole kind of uh, you know theme of my work at the moment. And let's finish off with the last work just shipped off to Charlotte, North Carolina. I was asked to contribute this piece to a show that's dedicated to and supporting frontline workers and I, 
uh, you know, it's called the superhero and I think that sums it up. And I think that's a great way to finish my little talk and thanks for listening. Andre, thanks so much. I mean, it's amazing to have um, an artist who's like almost every piece that comes out, it's like another iconic statement that's, you know, that, that's gonna be there for posterity. Yeah, yeah. thanks Thank Ryan. Betty, you ready? Betty? Yeah. Okay, here we go. Mm hmm.
Once upon a time, in a far-off kingdom, lived a young maiden, a sad young lad, and a childless baker with his wife. Nana, you're muted. I hope you can connect with the images. Betty, thanks so much. So I'm going to take it off us off of PowerPoint. And I'm going to stop share. And Adam, I'm going to let you take it from here. Nice job, everybody. Yes, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Round of applause for all of our great presenters tonight. Um, so uh, thank you all very much for uh, joining us for our first uh, Princeton Pecha. Uh, we're very excited. I was watch. I was following along in the chat. It was um, uh, uh, it was a nice little su uh, surprise there at the end. But uh, if you have any questions, uh, since none were really posed in the chat as we went, other than technical uh, sort of questions. Um, there's a hundred of us on here, so I'm not exactly sure if we want to do a, a hand raise uh, emoji uh, down at the reactions. Uh, but we'd love if you have any questions for the artist or have any uh, comments other than there were some beautiful things in the comments. All the artists that uh, participated, please uh, look through the artists um, to make sure. And I want to know that um, I want uh, Betty to know that um, Anne said, "Fabulous, mom." <laughs> love, love you. <laughs> Just in case you don't get to the uh, to the chat section down at the end. Um, let, me make, let me make a suggestion. I like the hand raise idea. Um, you know, for the artist, please take a look at the chats. Um, I obviously wasn't looking at it as we were going through because we were sharing my screen. But please take a look at the comments. Um, but it maybe you know uh, we we have at least a hand raised right now. I think that's kind of maybe the easiest way to do this. Uh, uh, Gail, that's Gail. Gail, you have a question? I know, I think your hand went up around. Actually, it's not, it's not me. I don't know what that's doing up there. <laughs> I'll, low, I'll lower it for you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, I guess I'll, I guess I'll start with a question uh, or a comment uh, to Tasha uh, regarding uh, one of her first comments out of the gate um, see, seemed to be, um, uh, change in consciousness at the time or, or seeing something where she needed the inspiration. I, I, I don't know if you want to revisit that or um, remind me of what it was that you were addressing. I don't know if that was uh, related to COVID, uh, related to the lockdown, or if that happened beforehand. 
Okay, it didn't, you know, it, it wasn't uh, connected with COVID. Um, I had just lost my husband in 90, 1992, and I joined the Y for a walking club, and uh, I had never really photographed before. And so uh, in the middle of the winter, we were still walking, and I put this little point and shoot into my pocket, and overnight, uh, the, there was this ice, the ice flowers on the water, and um, it, it, it did something for me. I mean, these... I took two pictures and then I thought, well, you know, I think I've got something. And then I started taking a course and that sort of changed my life. Um, Adam, if you could just point out for folks in terms of how to raise their hands. Uh, down at the bottom here along this line, if you have a, uh, uh, your PC down at the bottom in that corner, there's a button that says reaction. If you uh, hit that button, uh, you can, um, you know, ask uh, any question you want. I guess uh, Crosby and her Vermont family uh, clapped for us. Hi, thank you for the clapping. <laughs> I hope that was in relation to my point, my Vanna White effect, but maybe it was just uh, in celebration of the... Uh... Uh, Ricardo. Ricardo, you need to unmute. Okay. Um... Okay, so I'm curious, with Andre, uh, he mentioned two words that weren't clear to me because this is my first exposure to his work. First, he talked about blurriness, and the second, he talked about three-dimensional. Um, all the images I was looking at were directly on, flat, so I'm, I'm imagining that they were raised in relief, but I, I was hoping he might address that a little bit more. Yeah, well, obviously, sending out the slides, I couldn't really show the three-dimensional aspects too much on the flat slides, but they they raised up a, probably about six or seven layers of thin Lego, so about maybe three centimeters off the off the flat surface. You, you have to, I mean, you have to see them. I mean, it's just it's just the way the way it is. And what about the blurriness? Well, that's just kind of a result of when you're working with pixels, you're inevitably uh, going to get some kind of uh, reduction in quality. And I've tried to use that to as kind of a positive, if you like, to work with the material rather than work against it. So if you're working with pixels, you may get some kind of blurriness from that. And so, in, for example, State of the Union, I deliberately used it to blur the image and because I was trying to get the message across that um, politicians' messages are very, very blurred and not clear. Um, you know, the, what they say is not really what they deliver. Of course, that was, I made that piece in 2016 with Barack Obama and obviously everything has changed since then and how we look at and listen to politicians, but that was the general feeling back then. Andre, while you're in the hot seat, um, can you just talk a little bit about your process and how it came to be that you decided to use Legos as your medium? Uh, well, basically, I just wanted a, a medium that was physical in some nature. I wanted something that wasn't just going to hang on the wall, but was actually also physical and tactile. And so I was completely open to whatever to, I was going to use. And I came to Lego because I, we used to be a web designer, had a lot of digital skills, computer skills. So I could do a lot of the design process on the computer beforehand. And so the whole thing came together, I had these design skills from my earlier career. And then I had this tactile and physical medium, and I just brought it together. Great, thanks, Andrew. Uh, um, it looks like iPhone Frankie Harris. Yes, um, I'm ashamed to admit it. I cannot remember the artist that did the photographs, but those were wonderful. Just took my breath away. My uh, granddaughter is um, a shutterbug. She loves to take pictures and she took some in a water setting where there happened to be some gasoline, I guess, from a car. And it was amazing the way she captured all those different colors and everything. And the way you did it with the uh, the frozen, you know, the ice crystals. Oh, there you are, the little redhead, yes. I mean, really, I was, I was impressed. I really was, I thought it was excellent, I really did. Being here in South Carolina, I don't get to see that much of, of frozen things and everything, but it was beautiful, it really was, touched me. Thank you for sharing. Thank you, Frankie. Um, Ricardo. 
Yes. Um, so Reinhold, when when he was making his presentation, he was begun it in an anecdote, and he left us at this cliffhanger moment where he's bent <laughs> over a table. And I was just hoping he'd finish that story and then relate it back to his artwork. Well, no, I can't. <laughs> and 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 let me let me say this. You know, I first of all thank you guys for inviting me to do this and. Uh, I, I'm, I'm 63 years old, and so what, uh, now I, maybe 62, uh, but I'm old. And, <laughs> and, and at this point, I like to experiment. I like to take every opportunity I can to learn something new, uh, whether that's in art, whether that's in presentation. So I say that to say that you were actually spared. It was better for me to talk about the art than to go through uh, what I was going to go through. Um, so, <laughs> uh, but the, the antidote, the antidote I, I was referencing was, uh, bottom line is my mother and the church is all very important to me in my work, whether, I, even though I'm not religious, but to, as for most of the artists here, your upbringing seeps into what you do. I mean, I wish I could, I wish I could do Legos. I played with Legos all the time. And I know Andre must have fun. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but that, that particular story, next time, a year from now when I'm doing Petra, I'll have it together. I'll tell you the story of my mother beating my butt. <laughs> <laughs> Sound, sounds good. Um, is there, um, did, Frankie, you didn't raise your hand again, did you? Just check in. All I was going to say, and I, I almost did, I was going to say Serena Williams is you know, a, a goddess for sure. I agree with you on that one. Um, uh, Ricardo, you didn't have another question, did you? I saw your hand was still up. Maybe I forgot to lower it. Actually, I do. And uh, I'm, I'm just <laughs> interested. So um, I'm interested in, in um, Betty Curtis's work his is a certain wonderful sense of um, of being an ingenue, a naivete about the, the approach. And I was curious about how she discovers her subjects in her perspective on it. Betty, are you there? You're 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 oh you're muted you're uh, you're muted now. Just unmute again. I'm sorry. There you go. You're good. Okay. Oh. You're good, perfect. Okay, okay. Um, I, I have to feel something. Um, that, that sounds really naive, but um, it really, I can't just say, I think I will do um, correspondence. I was so moved by Justin Tice and when Jamel Khashoggi, I, I felt that so strongly, I had to campaign him. And I think I'm just an, an emotional uh, artist. I don't, and things pique my interest, so I go after them. And that's it, I wanna use, I, I like the idea of literary, uh, I think Ponder was talking about that. Um, we could interpret it. I've done Billy Budd. Uh, all my uh, work sort of has a background to it. Like um, the Titanic is the juxtaposition of these happy people on this ship, which was not meant to sink. It, it just, it astounds me. So I did a lot of research on it and found, a, and I think it's almost our daily living that things happen and we can't almost believe what's happening, particularly now. So I like that dichotomy, I guess. I, I don't like to talk too much about it, but thank you for asking. I. I, I had a question that's going to end up being a question for Heather, but let me kind of approach it this way. 
just kind of like watching everybody on the screen, uh, it's occurring to me, and this is by pure happenstance, you know, from one of the organizers of this, but it's happenstance, um, you know, that I'm looking at Betty and knowing that she, you know, her, she entered um, um, visual art from a background in theater and Reinhold entered art from a background in law and Andre entered art from a background in computer science and Heather entered art with a background in geology. And so here's, I have a question about Heather for you about materials. And I'm, I don't know whether it specifically relates to your geology background, but it's interesting that you now are doing work for L'Oreal with color. And I'm wondering, you know, how it is that you, you know, go about exploring color. Is it by instinct? Is it by plan? Is it a combination? What, what what's your approach? Hmm. Well, there's some just beautiful harmonies in in colors naturally, like chords when you play music. And they gave me one of the colors of the year was was plum, and it, we came up with the a, a deep blue purple and then you know first my first job was well which what kind of plum and so mixing gosh the ultramarine was an inorganic pigment and the purple was an organic dioxine purple but but they mixed together to give a a color that that they were they were happy with and then my job was to come up with paintings based on some pieces of classical music that they had given me that represented different um, mm. ages in a woman's life, the young woman, the middle-aged woman and the older woman, and what colors would, um, would become these, these women at different ages? What would they be attracted to? Well, anyway, I've got this painting behind me, it wasn't for them, but this one has a lot of iron oxides in it. And that painting you saw in my um, slideshow had a lot of natural, warm iron oxides that appeal to to the older older women and also are very harmoniously compatible with that blue purple plum hmm. yeah and, and all of your pieces are just so beautiful i'm i'm one of the lucky people that get that that's gotten to be a uh, student of heathers so lucky me and <laughs> lucky all the rest of your students um yeah And Maria, it's it's we're we're lucky to get to see your you know your artwork you know so we you know so often you're kind of playing the role of the you know artistic programmer and planner and uh, it's you know it's a treat to kind of you know see you work and hear you talk about it. Isn't it the truth, Ryan? They just they just work me like a dog at the arts. <laughs> yeah, I hope you have it. Can you do something about that? I hope you have a nice, yeah, uh, no, nice comfortable bed of flowers where you can relax. <laughs> I hope you can line up all those heads for a show. <laughs> yeah, so that's the next step, Maria, you said. You're, those are maquettes for larger works? Yeah, yeah. Hope so. Huh. I have to take the next six months off, Adam, I, as we need to tell you. <laughs> 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 Good. I'm, I'm happy. I have to pursue your your passion, right? I love to see folks. I, you know, it was, it was interesting. I hadn't seen uh, your um, presentation prior to this event, and it was interesting to see you um, with that span of uh, interests in art, both media and um, scale. You know, working on the large scale murals is quite a bit of a different experience. It would seem to me than working on such a small intimate uh, scale. And, and not only that, but a scale, I mean, I guess it's not much different from a, the initial drawings you took, um, sketches, as you said in your very first slide, start with a sketch and then go to a large scale. And uh, I guess the ceramics is that way too, but it was great to see that, uh, the interest in both um, sort of the more monumental and mm -hmm. uh, you know, the small scale, the intimate. Yeah, and I, I just wanted to say to Andre that I, I loved his presentation. I, I thought, well done, just so much fun. Thanks, Maria. We're the colorful ones. <laughs> kind of in your face color, I mean, <laughs> rather than the subtle. 
<laughs> it looks like Ricardo's got his hand up. Sorry, I was gonna say, yeah. Oh, I was hoping that, uh, that Maria could address uh, a distinction between public and personal art because she's she's somebody that seems to be out there in the street with these larger projects. I mean, you also have some of the, the, sm the smaller dimensions, more internal ones, but I was hoping she could address that distinction. Uh, well, that, that's a good question, Ricardo. I, um... You know, I've worked at the Arts Council for so long, and um, many people will come up to me and ask, well, what is your medium? And probably over the last few years, I've said, well, whatever needs to be done. And um, it's just become the nature of the job is, is trying to do whatever needs to be done. But I, I do love jumping. Um, around in scale it's it is really interesting and i think adam was correct and after putting those big murals up i wanted something that i could just like put on a table or hold in my hand which was um, almost like a, a little vacation but um <clears throat> and the public art stuff is is always um kind of uh, complicated because you have to ask for permission and you're putting it out there and and it's it's everyone's watching you do it um but i i really uh i, I really enjoy it so it but it's it's much different from probably um what i would choose to make on my own if i was left to my own devices i'm not sure if that answered your question well, i think you did because in 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 the pieces that you're making for yourself those little sculptures you had something that was a little bit disturbing that, you know, with a bird pecking at a person's head or a saw or something like that, you know, the, the danger, the, those things, um, that would be very difficult to produce in the public arena. Yeah, probably so. All right, all right, um, it's about, uh, almost 9.15. I don't know if anybody has any last thoughts that they'd like to put out there, last questions, comments. Artists too. Um, Maria started us, uh, off by the uh, artists can also ask questions uh, of each other or questions of themselves. I have a question. For uh, Alan Ryan. When is your next uh, Petra Kucha? Oh, I think we've got to decide that. It's a good thing you're on the committee. Yeah. <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> that was my question. Um, I, I think, look, we had 100 people on, on at the beginning of this and almost right to the end, we had 100 people. And I think that um, there seems to be uh, an audience for this. So I think we can, uh, it's fair to say we'll be doing another one in short order. Absolutely. Ryan, Ryan's a master PowerPointer now. Well, my oh, I, I think Reinhold's doing the next one. <laughs> I don't know about that. No, I think I had the wrong wrong images. So <laughs> you did that to change it up, Ronald. Put you on the spot. <laughs> uh, buddy, you had a question. Um, I just want to thank Ryan because he spent hours compiling and helping us, helping me, and I don't know about other people, but I'm sure he did. So yeah. I thank, thank you, Ryan. Thank, no, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Betty. Thank, thank you all. Thank you, Ryan, and thank you all the artists for participating. And uh, thank the Artist Resource Committee here at the Arts Council of Princeton for uh, inspiring us to um, to reach out uh, during this time and and uh, and join hands. And and this was great. So thank you all very much for coming. And uh, stay tuned for the next one. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. Cheerio. Thank you.